Hello, I am Riele, and today I would like to share this pastel painting process with you while talking some dragon nonsense. I spotted this dragon-like tree in 2014 during my second visit to the White Sea, so it has waited for me for almost a decade to paint. White Sea is truly a unique place. Although it is located beyond the polar circle, it still is influenced by the North Atlantic Drift, a continuation of Gulf Stream. It makes this region way warmer than many other places at the same latitude, like Beringia, or especially the Antarctic, that is isolated by the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. The port of Murmansk, which is located a bit further to the north, like the Norwegian ports, doesn't freeze in winter. Such a climate creates a rich ecosystem, attracting many biologists, and I was very lucky to visit the White Sea Biological Station for a practical after my third year although I didn't study any field-based science but physiology. Future zoologists and botanists have a proper field practical after their first year collecting and identifying plants, lichens and invertebrates using identification guides. For us it was more lab-based, but still making use of exotic organisms. We studied responses of sea squirts to neurotransmitter receptor agonists, recorded action potentials in hearts of some marine worms, or 24-hour ECG from cod. By the way, can you imagine how to anesthetize a fish to implant electrodes? You dissolve the anesthetic in seawater, then you put a tube that brings this water in the fish's mouth, and as the water passes through the gills, the fish can breathe and the drug diffuses into the bloodstream. Then you quickly do the surgery and release the fish into a tank, where you then record its ECG. In the neighboring tank, some serpent stars are crawling the walls. The station relies on volunteers and students, so aside from studying, in the afternoon we had some sort of community service, such as collecting trash on the littoral or weeding plants in a small botanical garden tended by one of our professors. One afternoon I was raking grass around the station while listening to whatever I had on my iPod, and that happened to be the last lecture of the Introduction to the New Testament History and Literature course by Professor Dale B. Martin. It is an older course from 2009, but it's still online at Open Yale courses as of July 2024. But as I was googling it, I found out that Professor Martin passed away last year. Let him rest in peace. In 2014, when a friend of mine invited me to go to the White Sea for vacation, I couldn't refuse. 2014 was an anomalously warm year. The temperature stayed around 30 degrees centigrade for two months, and by August the sea was so warm that you could bathe there for hours. The year after that it never got warmer than plus 16, if I'm not mistaken. The tree trunk that I'm painting now was close to my friend's house and, like a proper eternal serpent, probably still remains. Barely anything changes in those climes. These dusty lichens grow slower than one millimeter per year, and I saw snags left by a forest fire that had happened some 20 years before, and they looked as if they were just one season old. It is difficult to imagine such a slow turnover if you come from a warmer area. Another peculiarity is that the trees follow the sun in the course of a year, and this results in twisted wood. It is hard to notice on living pines, but when they die and lose their bark, you can see how twisted their trunks are. The pink rocks here carry no fossils. They are igneous granite, but even if they were sedimentary, they come from the Archean Eon, when there was only unicellular life. In other parts of the White Seashore, there are late Proterozoic sediments that carry very well-preserved Ediacaran biota, Animals and Loki knows what from before the Cambrian explosion. But as I couldn't find any semblance of dragons in that biome, I'll leave it for some future video. Or if you know some Ediacaran dragons, leave a comment and tell me about them. A couple of words about what is going on on the screen. I'm using white pastel matte paper that I toned with watered down gouache, earthberry pastels and carandash pastel pencils. I first do an underpainting with the same pastels, blending them with foam applicators so that I have a foundation on top of which I can work in visible strokes. And I apologize for not setting the focus correctly so that the paper goes out of focus from time to time. 
Now I know better and the new footage doesn't have this problem, but unfortunately I can't re-record this time-lapse. I first tried painting this dragon snack from life in watercolors, but then my skills were nowhere near to do it justice. I didn't finish that work and didn't keep it, so I can't show it to you, but trust me, it was bad. I got lost in the foliage in the background and probably wouldn't even be able to pull it off now had I stuck to watercolor. There was another attempt at it in ink, but an ink drawing cannot depict the dusty lichens and pink granites, so I didn't feel that I truly realized my idea. Back in 2014, I took some serious classes in art fundamentals, but it was not enough to have an effect right away, and although I greatly enjoyed the classes and learned a lot, I had to put my personal projects on the back burner and had to postpone some smaller ideas like this one until my skills have truly sunk in. I found a similar effect with learning languages. When I first took up Latin in high school, I was confused even by the simplest syntax. I could identify all the word forms, but this word soup did not constitute a text. These classes lasted a little under a year and did not move beyond the basics. But a decade later I came back to Latin and although I didn't remember the details of declensions, I suddenly could parse a text at first glance. Sometimes I feel that you have to live with some knowledge to apply it. What made me go back to this idea was the reading of the Iloyanka myth in our Hittite class. It so happens that every week, except for the summer breaks, we gather online to read some Hittite texts. And now it was time for the Iloyanka myth. This myth reached us in roughly nine copies on clay tablets from the Empire period, but the language suggests that the text is older. The text was not just written down for its literary merits, but to inform the ritual that took place during the Puruli festival or the New Year in the city of Nerik. The tablets contain two versions of how the storm god vanquished the Iloyanka serpent. In both versions, the storm god loses the fight to the serpent at first. In the first version, the storm god summoned the gods to the feast prepared by the goddess Inara. Then she went to the town of Zigarata and met a mortal named Hupasia. Inara tried to enlist him for the task of killing the serpent. He agreed if she slept with him, and so it happened. Then she hid Hupasia and invited the serpent for the feast. Then she hid Hupasia and invited the serpent to the feast. The serpent came with his children, they ate and drank, probably got drunk, and Hopasia bound the serpent with a cord. Then the storm god came and slew the serpent. Inara then built a house on a rock for Hopasia and forbade him to look out of the window when she was away. This story didn't end well for Hopasia. Of course, he looked out of the window, saw his wife and kids and asked Inara to let him go. And apparently she didn't like it and killed him in her wrath. Then, after a gap, comes the second version of the story. The serpent defeated the storm god and took his heart and eyes. Then the storm god married a poor man's daughter and sired a son. When the son grew up, he took the serpent's daughter as his wife. The storm god instructed his son, When you go to your wife's house, demand my heart and my eyes from him. He did so, bringing the body parts back to his father the storm god. Being complete again, the storm god decided to combat the serpent once again. But now the storm god's son stayed with the serpent and shouted up to heaven not to have mercy for him. So the storm god killed the serpent and his own son. You can find the complete translation in a paper by Gary Beckman, The Anatolian Myth of Iloyanka, that is available on ResearchGate, among other places. Beckman points out that in both versions of the myth, the gods need a mortal's help to defeat Iloyanka, and both times, too intimate of a connection with the gods doesn't end well for the mortals. The serpent myth, that ultimately reflects the triumph of order over chaos, is present in many Indo-European traditions and it is very likely not just a typological, but a genetic similarity. Culvert Watkins, in his book How to Kill a Dragon, which is available online and is a fascinating read, 
argues the different Indo-European societies had poetic traditions such as Homeric poems, Vedas or Avesta, and as we see parallels between them not only in content but in form, we can try to reconstruct the Proto-Indo-European poetic language. It is similar to the reconstruction of spoken proto-languages based on later languages, or the reconstruction of ancient genomes based on the genomes of extant species. Although methods differ, the principle is the same. It all started in 1853 with Adalbert Kuhn imperishable fame, pun intended. He noticed that Rig Vedic Akshiti Shravach and Shravas Akshitam and Homeric Leos Aphiton mean imperishable fame and are not just two cognate words from two related languages, but represent a formula of a certain rhythmic structure that was already present in the ancestral language and poetic tradition. You can see the Proto-Indo-European reconstruction on the screen. A similar formula is present in the dragon-slaying myths. When the hero kills the serpent, numerous traditions use verbs that originate from the same Proto-Indo-European root quen, present in Greek ponos, murder, Sanskrit hanti, he kills, Old East Slavic ganati, to chase, or English bane. You probably can name several examples of X became Y's bane formula yourself. Please give this video a like for my attempts at pronunciation or give it a dislike if you actually know how these things are supposed to be pronounced and let me know in the comments. How do we know that Iloyanka even was a serpent? Here comes the very interesting feature of the cuneiform script that Hittite borrowed from the Babylonians and ultimately from the Sumerians who invented it. Cuneiform is largely a syllabic script, so most characters signify a single syllable such as ma or sal. However, some signs are logographic and represent a complete word or a concept. Logograms are not originally Hittite per se, but they were borrowed from the Sumerian or Akkadian as part of a writing system. By convention, when we transliterate Hittite texts, the Hittite words are written in small italics, Sumerian words are written in all caps, and Akkadian words are written in italic capitals. These logograms may replace the phonetic sounds in a phrase such as the one you see on the screen, and that is translated and gods were with him. Dingirmesh sha was not a loan word and was not pronounced as such, but rather it stood for Siunesa, where Siunes is the plural gods, together with a clitic a that means and. This is very similar to us using Arabic numerals or currency symbols in a text rather than spelling them out letter by letter. We may even put phonetic complements to mean ordinal numbers as opposed to cardinal ones, like first or second. A more interesting usage of logograms was so-called determiners. Determiners were signs that came together with certain words and specified their category, but they were not pronounced. So there were special signs for male names, female names, deity names, cities, wooden and stone objects, or types of meat and bread, just to name a few. So, when I go to Pergamon Museum or to the Louvre and see texts in, for example, Hurrian or Akkadian that I don't know whatsoever, I can see where the god names are. As for the animals, there were signs for birds, mushen, and serpents, mush, among others. Thus, each time the name Illuyanka appears in the text, there is a mush sign in front of it, like you see in the example on the screen. Tarhuntas came and killed the serpent Iluyanka, and gods were with him. The Hittite Quenta he killed, which we see in this example, also originates from the same dragon-slaying Proto-Indo-European root Quen. Moreover, as Hittite is an Indo-European language, there is very literal evidence that Iluyanka was a serpent that comes from the name itself. Joshua T. Katz, in his paper How to be a dragon in Indo-European, argues that the word Iluyanka follows a bipartite structure with the first element Ilu stemming from the Proto-Indo-European word that ultimately gave rise to the word 
for eel in English and other Germanic languages. The second element, Janka, is cognate with Latin anguis, snake. Actually, Latin and Greek have the same kind of formation, but in reverse. The Latin word for eel is anguilla, with a long e, which literally would mean snake eel, while iluyanka is eel snake. The Greek form anchilus is not so transparent for most of us, but follows the same pattern. Of note, Bellerophon, who slayed the chimera, also with some snaky parts, was called Elerophon by Xenodotus. The second part, Fontes, is the prototypical dragon slaying Indo European root quen. Katz argues that Elero may be compared with the Hittite Illu or Elu and may actually precede the version with initial B, as Bellero doesn't have any satisfactory etymologies. If you want to learn more about the Hittite language and other languages of ancient Anatolia, I'd like to recommend a channel that I discovered recently. It's called Learn Hittite and has video essays on different obscure languages, including the new sensation, the language of Kalashma. Indo-European commonalities are fun, but serpent stories of some sort are way older than the Indo-European unity some 6,000 years ago, and this is not a speculation. There are ontological myths, or what used to be myths, about the origins of death. They can be summarized as snakes are immortal because they shed their skin and humans are mortal because they don't. Sometimes, instead of snakes shedding skin, trees shed their bark. In many such stories, mortality is actually a choice. A deity offered humans and snakes packages with life and packages with death. Humans chose death and snakes chose life. In other stories, humans slept through the announcement of how to become immortal or rather be reborn, but snakes heard it and followed the instructions. It is hard to imagine, but these motifs date back to at least 20,000 years ago and possibly even 50,000 years ago, to the time when modern humans left Africa. If you look at the distribution of this motif around the world, it is present in Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, South Asia, Indonesia, Melanesia, and Northern Australia. On the contrary, it is almost absent in Europe, Northern Asia, and North America. Another motif with similar geographical distribution is the immortal moon. The moon, unlike people, rejuvenates every month, or even decides whether people revive or die forever. This one is also present in southern Australia, which is inhabited by groups that arrived in Australia earlier. These are not the only such motifs that separate the tropical from the Eurasian and North American mythology. This recurring pattern leads us to believe that these commonalities are not a coincidence, but evidence for the existence of these motifs at least at the point when the respective groups lost contact. From archaeological and genetic data, we know that it happened some 50,000 years ago. The first evidence of humans in Australia dates back to at least 48,000 years ago, and genetic evidence is concordant with these dates. The later waves of settlers came to Australia over 20,000 years ago. We have no idea and probably will never know what language these people spoke back then, but we can catch a glimpse of what their stories were about. If you want to learn more, please visit the Motif database that has been developed by Yuri Bereskin since the 1980s, I believe. It has all the references to the original text and maps them onto the world map. You can play with the map at mapsofmyths.com. You'll have to log in with customer as login and ether as password. And no, this is not some secret info. The login details are published on the main database website, which is areasofmyth.com. As we draw towards the end, I would like to say that I'm really satisfied with the result and I feel that pastels were the right choice of media for this topic. The powdery nature of chalk pastels perfectly fits the lichens in the foreground, the most distinct feature of Karelian forests. Thank you for watching, give this video a like, write a comment, especially if you have any criticism, and don't be afraid to revisit your old ideas, sometimes they truly come together over time.